Welcome to Physiology by Physio, an Inside the Boards podcast. This show brings together some of the best boards-relevant content for physiology and pathophysiology from three innovative platforms, Physio, Inside the Boards, and Med School Phys. All right, guys, so this episode is going to focus on the basics of renal anatomy, uh, blood flow through the kidney, and the beginning parts of the nephron. Uh, nephrology can be pretty tough, but stick with it and everything will fall into place, I promise. Now, I have to warn you, we are going to be talking a lot about urine here, so this will probably be even worse for your bladder than hearing like a dripping faucet or thinking about waterfalls. So if you need to take a bathroom break, now's the time. All right, so for the beginning of this episode, I'm going to have the guys from Physio take it away with basic renal anatomy. Let's get started. The renal system consists of the kidneys, the ureters, the bladder, and the urethra. The kidneys have many functions, including the production of urine, the removal of waste products like urea or drugs, electrolyte and nutrient homeostasis, acid-base regulation and blood volume homeostasis, and the release of hormones such as erythropoietin, which stimulate the production of red blood cells. Before we jump into the details of all of these functions, let's take a moment to review some of the basic anatomy. As you'll remember from anatomy, the kidney actually consists of a cortex and a medulla. The renal artery is a direct branch of the aorta, and it provides blood to the kidneys. After several branches, the renal artery provides blood to the nephron through the afferent arterial. Blood is filtered as it passes the nephron, which results in the production of urine. Urine drains from the nephron into the ureter, which can then be stored in the bladder and ultimately excreted through the urethra. Examiners love to test about the clinical relevance of the variation in urethral size in men compared to women. Do you know which gender has the shorter urethra and how this is clinically relevant? Women have a shorter urethra, which makes it easier for bacteria to ascend into the bladder, resulting in cystitis or infection of the bladder. Normally, the ureters enter the bladder at an angle, which mitigates the movement of fluid from the bladder up the ureters and into the kidneys. They also contain valves, which help further reduce the risk. However, if the anatomy is at all abnormal, then there is an increased risk of cystitis becoming complicated pyelonephritis or infection of the kidneys. This is due to movement of bacteria from the bladder to the kidneys. Okay, so with our preamble out of the way, let's get a move on. Uh, We all know that the kidneys are vital organs that function to filter blood and play a role in other aspects of our physiology like vitamin D and erythropoietin production. So in this episode, I'm going to focus on the filtering aspect of the kidney and the physiology of the functional unit of the kidney, which is the... the nephron. So let's warm up by doing a brief overview of the structures of the nephron and the flow of blood and filtrate through the nephron. So can you name the different parts of the nephron? Well, you should be picturing the following structures in your head. Uh, So we've got Bowman's capsule with the glomerulus, then the proximal tubule, then the descending limb of the loop of Henle, then the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, then the distal tubule, and finally the collecting duct. So some of these structures are in the renal cortex, while others dip down into the renal medulla. So Bowman's capsule is in the cortex, and so is the proximal convoluted tubule. Then the loop of Henle descends into the medulla, And then we're back up in the cortex when we reach the distal convoluted tubule. Then the distal convoluted tubule will feed into a collecting duct, which will descend back down into the renal medulla, and those collecting ducts will eventually coalesce to form the pyramids, the renal calyces, the renal pelvis, and eventually a ureter. Okay, so that should help jog your memory about the basic structure of the nephron, and that described the flow of the renal filtrate that becomes urine in the nephron. Now, I use that word filtrate. What do I mean by that? Well, at the start of the nephron, plasma was originally filtered out of a blood vessel in the glomerulus and into Bowman space. So as you know, Bowman space is the beginning of the luminal space of the nephron. Did all of the blood get filtered, though? Well, no, only a portion of the plasma was filtered. So 20% of the plasma gets freely filtered through the blood vessels at the glomerulus and into Bowman space. Now, we've already covered the flow of filtrate through the nephron, so let's briefly discuss the flow of blood in the nephron. Uh, Blood came into Bowman's capsule from the 
afferent arteriole. Then it reached the tangled ball of vessels for filtration, a.k.a. the, the glomerulus, and 20% of the plasma was filtered. And then the remaining 80% of the plasma and all the red blood cells that were in the glomerulus will continue in circulation, exiting the glomerulus in Bowman's capsule by the efferent arteriole. Then that blood passes from the efferent arteriole to the vasa recta and the peritubular capillaries. However, blood moving in the peritubular capillaries takes an interesting course, uh, and it does this to establish a countercurrent multiplier. Oh no, he's not going to try and describe the countercurrent multiplier system on a podcast, is he? It's just too soon. Well, I'm not going to go too crazy in describing the countercurrent multiplier, because a podcast just isn't the best format to discuss it. But the main thing that you need to know is that blood passes from the efferent arteriole into the peritubular capillaries and vasa recta, moving towards the ascending loop of Henle. Then the blood is directed back towards the descending loop of Henle. It's a little counterintuitive, but this means that the blood flowing in the peritubular capillaries is moving in the opposite direction of the filtrate in urine that's moving through the loop of Henle. So you can basically think of it this way. These currents flow in opposite directions or counter to each other. Hence, they're termed a counter current. It's important to remember that this setup allows the nephron to maximize its ability to generate gradients for salt and water reabsorption. But for now, you should have the picture of the nephron in your head with all its components from the glomerulus to the collecting duct. And you should picture the flow of blood from the afferent arteriole to the glomerulus being filtered then to the efferent arteriole, then to the vasa recta and peritubular capillaries. And when the blood is going past the loop of Henle, it's going in the opposite direction of the filtrate that's in the lumen of the nephron, and this creates a countercurrent. It's also important to remember that the peritubular capillaries are actually the second set of capillaries in the nephron. The first was actually the glomerulus. So couple this information with the fact that the kidney has an end-organ blood supply, i.e. its only blood supply comes from the renal artery, so there are no anastomoses. This means that nephrons in the kidney are both using a lot of oxygen, i.e. two capillary sets, and there's no backup blood supply, i.e. end organ blood supply. And these two facts about the kidney make the kidney very prone to ischemic damage, say in the setting of hypotension. So as a side note, can you tell me which two areas of the nephron are the most prone to ischemia? Well, the proximal tubule, because those are the hardest working cells in the kidney, with all of their active transport, they're using a lot of ATP and a lot of oxygen, and we'll discuss them soon, but also the cells of the thick ascending limb, because they're both working hard and they're located in the renal medulla, which is the furthest away from its arterial supply. All right, everybody, this is Greg from Inside the Boards, and I'd like to cut in here and give a quick shout out to our sponsor for this episode, which is Physio. If you haven't figured this part out yet, we at Inside the Boards really do love what the guys at Physio are doing for the scene of medical education. Uh, first off, they produce this fantastic library of easy-to-consume videos, which cover everything you need to know about physiology for your classes and for the boards. But then they didn't stop there. They went on to produce two more libraries of rock-solid instruction for biochem and biostats, and their microbiology videos are currently in the works. So they're just super busy, and they're getting it done. But in creating new content, they didn't just like stay in their comfort zone with the old 15 minute long whiteboard style video. No, 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 no. At Physio, they understand that while some topics are best learned by focusing on the underlying process, other topics will just require brute force memorization. So to meet the needs of their learners, the guys at Physio came up with a cool new hybridized learning style that includes both Pathoma style whiteboard videos integrated together with sketchy style picture mnemonics. And by seamlessly integrating these two tried-and-true teaching tools, Physio will help you to master med school. Make sure you stick around for the rest of the episode so that you can hear about the exclusive deal that we at ITB got for you, the listener. And now, back to the show. Okay, so we've talked about the flow of renal filtrate, and we've talked about renal blood flow. Now let's get back on track and start talking about the physiology of the nephron in a way that makes intuitive sense, from the beginning to the end. So first up, we'll discuss some of the high yield points to know about Bowman's capsule. So within Bowman's capsule, you have the glomerulus, and plasma is being filtered out of the vessels of the glomerulus into the Bowman space. So what are some features of the glomerulus that allows plasma to be filtered? 
Well, for one, the endothelium of the glomerular blood vessels has fenestrations uh, that allows for selective filtration. Okay, so there's small holes in the endothelium, and the holes are small enough to prevent red blood cells and other cells from leaving. But how do we fine-tune that process to prevent things like albumin from leaving the blood? Well, just outside of the endothelium, we have the basement membrane, which has a latticework of proteins like type 4 collagen and laminin in it. But it also has the glycosaminoglycan, heparan sulfate. So why would heparan sulfate be important? Well, it provides a negative charge barrier, which repels negatively charged proteins like albumin and prevents them from passing through the filter into Bowman space. Okay, so the filter thus far has fenestrated endothelium and the glomerular basement membrane with proteins and negatively charged stuff. Then, just outside of the glomerular basement membrane, we have the last layer of the filter, the... the podocytes. So the podocytes have foot processes that interdigitate, and these podocytes form the last layer of the filter. Podocytes are also referred to as visceral epithelial cells of the glomerulus, and are continuous with the other epithelial cells that will end up lining the nephron. But let's not get ahead of ourselves here. So the filter of the glomerulus has three important layers. Fenestrated endothelial cells of the glomerular blood vessels, uh, the glomerular basement membrane, and podocytes with their foot processes, which are also known as visceral epithelial cells. After plasma passes through this filter, it's in the luminal space of the nephron. But before we keep moving forward down the nephron, I should mention what happens when the filter is damaged. So when this filter is damaged, you can end up spilling protein into the urine, like in nephrotic syndrome, or spilling red blood cells into the urine, like in glomerulonephritis. So speaking of hematuria, or spilling red blood cells into the urine, can you remember the name of a disease that we mentioned in our last episode characterized by hematuria and hemoptysis? Well, it's good pasture syndrome, which is caused by autoantibodies to what structure? To type 4 collagen in the glomerular basement membrane. And what kind of hypersensitivity reaction was this again? It's a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. So this hypersensitivity reaction causes inflammatory destruction of the glomerular basement membrane. Hence, good pastures is one of the causes of glomerulonephritis. And when the filter is damaged in this way, red blood cells can spill into the urine, which we call hematuria. So that's an example of glomerular pathology, but this show is meant to focus more of our time on physiology. So let's get back to that. So plasma has now been filtered from the vessel in the glomerulus into Bowman space. Next, the filtered plasma in Bowman space is now creatively called filtrate and it will enter the lumen of the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, so now we're in the portion of the renal cortex called the proximal convoluted tubule. So what happens here in the proximal convoluted tubule? Well, a lot of reabsorption occurs here, and some secretion also occurs here. So for right now, I'm just going to list some of the important things that happen, and then we'll discuss them individually. So let's take a look. All of the reabsorption of glucose and amino acids occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, Two-thirds of the reabsorption of water and most electrolytes, like sodium and potassium, occurs here. Uh, Fifty percent of urea reabsorption occurs here. Most of the reabsorption of bicarb occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule. Also, secretion of different substances occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule, things like ammonia and creatinine and PAH. Okay, guys, and it's that time again for another quick plug for our sponsor. Basically, all I want to say with this one is go get a subscription to Physio. They will help you to demolish step one with their high quality and cohesive conceptual videos, which are similar to the Pathoma whiteboard style. But these are also integrated with story-based mnemonic paintings, similar to the sketchy style. So you can master all of the hardest stuff that you need to know to crush step one. Oh, and did I mention that a subscription to Physio also gets you access to their thorough yet concise textbook too? What this means for you is that when you're using Physio, you don't need to furiously take notes. It's all written down for you, so you can just go with the flow of the videos and reference the textbook later as needed. They really are doing great work over at Physio, so go check them out. In a few minutes, in the next and last advertisement for this episode, we'll reveal our exclusive discount code for you, but for now, let's get back to it. Okay, very cool. So that took us from the events taking place in Bowman's capsule to the proximal convoluted tubule. Now, I want to close out the episode with a board-style practice question. You feeling ready for it? 
A 45-year-old female presents for a follow-up appointment with her family doctor after a recent visit to the emergency department for hip pain. The attending there told her that she had a pathologic hip fracture. She brought a printout of her labs from the ED, which showed low serum potassium, elevated creatinine, and low bicarb with a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Urinalysis showed glucosuria and low urine pH. She says that she was previously healthy, but further questioning reveals that she had a skin infection five months ago, which resolved after she took a week's worth of an unknown medication, which she found in the back of a closet at her dental hygiene clinic. Okay, that may have been a run-on sentence. But anyways, which of the following findings is most likely to be seen on a repeat urinalysis? Is it A, low urine phosphate, B, high urine amino acids, C, elevated urine nitrites, or D, Bentz jones protein? And the correct answer is B, high amino acid levels. So I hope this vignette wasn't too convoluted to follow, but this patient has acquired Fanconi syndrome from taking an expired antibiotic from her dental clinic. This is classically seen after taking expired tetracyclines, which could be nephrotoxic. Other common nephrotoxic drugs include agents like cisplatin, aminoglycosides, antiretrovirals, iodinated contrast, etc. Nephrotoxins hit the proximal convoluted tubule particularly hard because it's the first site in the nephron that really has to deal with their disposal. Fanconi syndrome is a syndrome caused by damage to the proximal convoluted tubule. There are many potential causes of Fanconi syndrome. Her case was acquired from taking a nephrotoxic drug. Some other acquired causes include heavy metals or multiple myeloma or amyloidosis. But there are also inherited causes of Fanconi too. Uh, the most common one in children is cystinosis, but it can also be seen in Wilson's disease and galactosemia and even fructose intolerance. So Fanconi syndrome can be inherited or acquired. Regardless of the cause, if the proximal convoluted tubule is damaged in Fanconi syndrome, what would we expect to happen to renal function? Well, now the proximal tubule isn't able to perform its vital jobs for kidney function. Stuff like the secretion of creatinine and other toxins, uh, as well as the resorption of glucose, hence we saw glucosuria in her UA, uh, reabsorption of amino acids, hence the correct answer was high amino acid levels in the urine, uh, resorption of phosphate will also be messed up, so her urine would have high phosphate levels, not low phosphate levels like one of the answer choices. And even the resorption of water, potassium, sodium, and bicarb will be affected by Fanconi syndrome. So the underlying pathophysiology of Fanconi syndrome helps to explain her labs that we saw in the emergency department, which showed that she has a low serum potassium, high creatinine, indicating renal dysfunction, and a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. So normal anion gap metabolic acidosis can be a tough one to remember, but there's actually a pretty good mnemonic to remember the limited differential diagnosis of normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. And this one isn't mud piles. That's for increased anion gap metabolic acidosis. For normal anion gap metabolic acidosis, it's going to be hard ass, spelled H-A-R-D-A-S. So H for hyperalimentation, A for acetazolamide, R for renal tubular acidosis. This is what she has. D for diarrhea, A for Addison's disease, and S for spironolactone. So our patient in this vignette has renal tubular acidosis. That's the best explanation for the normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. Specifically, she has RTA type 2. Now, I don't want to get into all the details here, but I found a decent mnemonic to actually remember the different types of RTA. Now, just work with me here, okay? So stick out your index finger. So type 1 RTA is due to a proton problem, like 1 plus for hydrogen protons, so one finger. So here, the kidney, specifically the distal parts of the nephron, like the alpha cells of the collecting duct, have a problem secreting acidic hydrogen protons into the urine, thus causing renal tubular acidosis type 1. So type 1, one finger out. Okay, now stick out two fingers. So type 2 renal tubular acidosis is due to low bicarb, so two fingers bicarb. Here we have a bicarb issue, like in Fanconi syndrome, where the proximal tubule cannot reabsorb bicarb, thus causing renal tubular acidosis type 2. So type 2, two fingers out, bicarb problem. 
Okay. And then renosubulacidosis is, is kind of weird. So we skip number three and we move straight on to number four. So now stick out four fingers straight up in the air. Okay. And now turn them sideways. Okay. So if you kind of squint at this a little bit, it kind of looks like the letter K, doesn't it? Well, that's what's unique about type 4 renal tubular acidosis, is that unlike types 1 and 2, type 4 RTA has hyperkalemia. So your fingers form the letter K for hyperkalemia. If you just remember these three things, all right, type 1 for hydrogen ion problem, type 2 for bicarb problem, and type 4 has a hyperkalemia problem, and you use your fingers to help remember that, you'll find that differentiating between the types of RTA and practice questions will be much, much easier. Okay, so I hope that mnemonic is helpful. Now getting back on track here. So our patient's labs showed normal anion gap metabolic acidosis with low serum bicarb, and this was in the setting of exposure to a nephrotoxin. So the best explanation is that she has type 2 renal tubular acidosis caused by Fanconi syndrome, where her proximal convoluted tubule was damaged, resulting in a limited ability to resorb bicarb. But in addition to bicarb, she also has trouble resorbing glucose and amino acids, which is what the answer choices we're getting at, as well as phosphate and even potassium and sodium and even water. Okay, so that pathophysiology stuff is pretty cool. But when she went to the family doc, she went there because she had a pathologic fracture and she had labs that she didn't know what to do with. So what's the deal with the pathologic fracture? Well, the proximal convoluted tubule is also the site in the kidney where the final step of vitamin D activation takes place, which is the 1-alpha hydroxylase reaction, which converts 25-hydroxyvitamin D, or calcidiol, into the active 1-25-hydroxyvitamin D, which is calcitriol. With low calcitriol levels, or active vitamin D levels, adults can develop a condition called osteomalacia, and osteomalacia predisposes them to weak bones and pathologic fractures. Okay, very cool, and let's quickly round out with the other answer choices. So answer choice A, her urine would actually have high urine phosphate, not low urine phosphate, because it's not being reclaimed at the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, so that was choice A, uh, now let's move on to choice C. Elevated nitrites in the urine would be seen in the setting of something like a urinary tract infection that's caused by a nitrite-producing bacteria, such as the common gram-negative bugs like E. coli. And let's cover the last answer choice here. So answer choice D, uh, Benz jones proteins from antibody light chains, was actually a reasonable response here if you were thinking about multiple myeloma, which can cause bone pain and is actually one of the more common causes of Fanconi syndrome. In multiple myeloma, the proteinaceous antibodies that are being pumped out by the myeloma cells can become nephrotoxic. However, multiple myeloma doesn't really fit her story very well because of her relatively young age and the mystery medication, so we wouldn't expect to see Benz Jones proteins here. Okay, so I hope my explanations made sense. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you guys next time. Okay, and the time has arrived for the big reveal that was promised. For ITB listeners, we were able to secure you a limited time 25% discount if you enter the code ITB25, as in 25%, at checkout. This code is good for 25% off your physio subscription, but it's only valid for one month from the time that this episode airs. So again, that's ITB25 for an exclusive 25% discount on a physio subscription from yours truly at Inside the Boards. And guess what? That's it for this episode of Physiology by Physio. So thanks for listening and learning. Now go live it up.